made everybody all the time at the same time. Or yesterday, I didn't know it was a ballad of man's hunt. Some things just go over my head. As far as I didn't know. Or yesterday, when we had so many people here for celebration of life, but it's also a ballad of man's. And Sergeant Mark, I'm giving, and really screaming, worked magic.
and my family, my brother, Chief, welcome. <laughs>
how he fasted and then started his preaching mission in Galilee after hearing that John the Baptist had been arrested and put in prison. Our focus verses pick up describing the call of Jesus' first four disciples, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, who are casting a net into the sea, and then James and John working with their father Zebedee, who were repairing their nets. This encounter with Jesus led these four fishermen to answer the call to become disciples, abandoning all of their earthly possessions and their families to become what Jesus calls fishers of men. So what really happened here? We've all read these verses before. We, we, we been taught, we've done studies on it, but what is really happening here? We hear that they trusted Jesus when he came and told them to leave and go with him. And I will be transparent with you, that's where I thought we'd be going today and talking about how it requires trust for us to get up and just go, how hard it could be to just get up and go, that we have to trust Jesus and have faith in it, but as God would always have it, he always takes me a left and a right and an all around to get to where he wants me to be. What happened here is these four fishermen simply followed the leader. They had an encounter, they had a calling and a qualification, and then they had a cost. So what do we learn from Jesus' interaction with Simon Peter and with Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John? Well, first there was an encounter. Verses 18 and 21 tell us Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee and he noticed the two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew. And then it tells us in verse 21, and he went on a little further, he noticed two other brothers, James and John. Like Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John, our instructions to follow the leader always begins with that encounter with God. From the time of our salvation upon that encounter, we are instructed to follow the leader. That encounter with Jesus, when you first came to know him, when that sweet whisper in your heart brought you closer to him, the first thing that happens is that encounter. And if you are sitting here this morning under the sound of my voice, you have had an encounter. You thought you woke up this morning and decided to get up and get dressed and come here to Central. You thought that alarm clock went off and because it went off and you were up early enough, you said, I'm gonna get up and just go. What it was was that encounter, that interaction, that one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, that prompting of the Holy Spirit that told you that this is the place where you needed to be. You see, that encounter that happens that changes our lives. Some of you may remember your encounter. Perhaps your encounter was a burning bush encounter. Something major happened in your life that brought you to your knees for you to have that encounter. Yeah. Perhaps it was a sweet wind that just blew by and you felt the power of the Holy Spirit fall upon you when you were drawn into this Jesus who you had never known before. And whether you are 40 years, 50 years, or 60 years into your encounter or 60 seconds into your encounter with Jesus, it first begins when we meet him. But what is amazing about us meeting him is he always meets us at the place where we are. We don't have to go somewhere. We don't have to be something for Jesus to come and encounter us. We don't have to be the pastor to have an encounter with Jesus. We don't have to be in the choir to have an encounter with Jesus. All we have to do is just be there. See what I, I love about Jesus is that he's a real gentleman. He doesn't force himself, he doesn't push himself. All he does is remain there, always letting me know that his arms are open. When I slip and I slide and I go left, when he tells me to go right, when I don't quite follow the leader, he never leaves me nor forsakes me. And see, that's the thing about Jesus. He's not like the people in our lives, right? 
sometimes we look around and the people that we think that we need the most, they're not there for us. But Jesus, the one who holds our hand, the one who rocks us to sleep at night when there is pain in our bodies, the one who carries us when we don't have the strength to go anymore, the one who lets us know that even in the darkest hours of the night, there is a promise of a dawn coming in the morning. That encounter with Jesus changes your life in ways that you could never have imagined. Even if you think there hasn't been a change, a change has already come over you. See, you walk a little differently. You talk a little differently. You don't go to the places you used to go. You don't do the things you used to do. And for some of you, that encounter means that there are people in your life who may no longer want to be in relationship with you. But what I know that when Jesus has an encounter with us and he changes us, he takes us along a road. See, when he got Simon Peter and Andrew and James and John to follow him, he, he didn't leave them alone. He told them to immediately go with him. He told them to immediately set aside and stop what they were doing. How many of us in that encounter with Jesus, when we get that immediate instruction to follow the leader, would say, I'm ready, God, let's go. And I know most of us will say, well, of course I will do it. But what if you get that call to go to Haiti tomorrow to help with cleanup? or Puerto Rico after an earthquake. Or the pastor calls and says, I have a ministry opportunity in South America, but I need you to commit to me for six months. How many of you are going to immediately say, Pastor, I'm ready to go? Or we'll say, well, Pastor, gotta let my boss know. Gotta make sure that I've got my mortgage paid up for the next six months, and I gotta make sure I got enough money to make sure all my bills are paid. How many of us just drop our necks with that encounter with Jesus and just follow the leader. This is not to be a condemnation because I, I, I battle. I said, well, Lord, if you, if you told me right now I had to pack up and leave, I like the comforts of the things that I have. I'll be honest, I like sleeping in my bed. I like the warmth of the heat in my house. I like the lights that come on. I like them. So I don't know if six months somewhere where I may not have running water and facilities barely would be really attractive to me right now. I have to deal with that, but see, my prayer is It's 
not a job that's looked upon with a lot of prestige in a lot of places. They were fishermen. Yeah. Yeah. And this is who Jesus called. He called them from what a lot of people would think out of a place that was a place of nothing. He called them to go with him without any degrees, yeah. without going to seminary. Yeah. He called them, they weren't even the upper echelon or high status in Israel. They were simply ordinary, hard-working folk who he called. But their encounter with Jesus and the sub subsequent callings let them do some extraordinary things, like heal the sick and win souls for Jesus Christ. Jesus chose ordinary people to be his first disciples. And guess what? In 2020, he is still choosing ordinary people. Like you, like me, like our children and our youth, like our young adults. Y'all, this is an intergenerational thing happening in this pulpit right now. We have, I think, our generation, we have Y generation, we have millennials, we have Xers. <laughs> What you 
do on a Saturday night. Some of you may need to go to the club to get a start.
Jesus, discipleship costs. Right here is where you start paying in obedience. Is it a high cost to your obedience? Yes. But the blessings and the rewards far outweigh the cost. For what you give up, you get so much more in return. You get peace. You get joy. You get love. And you get the promise of living in eternal glory with Jesus Christ. I guarantee you. Ray is a great businessman. He knows about that ROI. When you put out that re return, your investment, you want to get a good return, right, Ray? You want to lose money when you go into the stock market. You want to make money. You put $10 in, you want to get way more than $10 back, right? Well, this is the best return on investment. You know? Central is a lot of 
ways for us to be disciples. I started with us doing something physical because I took Zuma. And I use my Zuma class as a way for me to minister. I tell people, give me one hour, leave whatever you have going on at the door, give me one hour. At the end of our Zuma class, I always do a song that's uplifting and telling people to listen to the words. And at the end, I always take our last deep breath and tell them it's there and get to the most beautiful women and the most handsome men in the world. Because I want them to live with an affirmation of who they are. And so anything that you do can be ministry and you can use it as a disciple. And so I invite you, if you are here today, and you have had an encounter with Jesus, but you may be a little bit unsure of your call or maybe you're
children, I return. 